Okay, so let's have a look at this. You got double, right? And you took this? Yeah, I took this because I thought I had... So I got 20 ways to come on immediately. I'm a favorite to come in. Um, I, I had points... That I, my, the outfield was covered well. So, uh, you know, when I do when I do come in... Well, I mean... Okay, I'm try, I'll tell you what, what my thinking was at the time. My thinking was that I've got plenty of ways to come in and uh, I've got an okay board and he has, and I've got the outfield kind of covered. I guess now what I'm looking at is let's say I do come in. If I don't come in with a one, six or a two, five, I have to play something like I'm stripped in the outfield. So what I was thinking of outfield coverage is actually a kind of more liability. So like, what am I going to play? Take one, like take the spare off the eight. Have to break one of the either the eighteen or the mid. Do something in board that's destructive. There's not. Okay, let let let's say all of that's right, which not all of it is, but most of it is. Um, what you're missing one big thing. Okay, what is what? that? The, the fact that he's gamuts. Ah, uh, right. So you can't okay. just, it's not just many about winning the game. It's about how, how many gammons does he win and how many do you win? Yeah, okay. So, so what, what, let's I've estimate, how many, what percentage of the time do you think you get gammon? Okay, so I've got lots of checks in the outfield. Uh, see, so if I get closed out, it's high. So let's say maybe... 30% yeah, here, very just good. under. Excellent. That's, that's spot on. I think it's around 30, right? 32. Okay, yeah. So but, if yeah, you're getting okay. gammon 32% of the time, and you, how many gammons do you think you win from here? It's like... Well, with the five point... Well, he's got the five point yeah, anchor. It's like a handful. So... Right? Hardly any. Yeah, not many. Yeah. Less than 10, maybe? Way less. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, yeah. yeah, just, yeah call, so. just call it very few. You know, so... If you're losing, say, 30% gammons, how many games do you have? What percentage do you need to take? Uh, as in, I need... Winning perc gammons what, worth what percentage of games do you need to win? If you, if you did the maths and you know you're getting gammon 30% okay. of the time, what percentage of the time do you need to win the game? Uh... Well, gamma's worth half as much, so it would be take point plus 15, right? Yeah. 15%. Yeah. So what's that, 25, 35, 40, like just 40%, just yeah. under 40%? So if, I, if yeah. I just told you before saying, oh, I've got a stronger board and I come in and I win and blah, blah, blah. If we just said, what is the problem here? You know, what, what, hmm. am, what am I looking to solve? Uh, when you, when, if I said to you, do you have 40% winning chances here? You'd say not a chance, right? No. Because yeah. you estimated the gammons yeah. perfectly. So if, yeah. you, if you then put that into what percentage of games do I need to win, you wouldn't get close to 40 here, would you? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so you just, you just pass. The main, I think the main issue with this position is, A, say you come in as well. Say he rolls whatever, you come in. What are you going to come in with? Name me a number. Yeah, well, unless it's one, one six or two five, mm. it's not good. And it's he can quite, hit loose because he's got a stronger board. It's quite, it's, the thing is these, these games often takes when, when you can turn the game around quite quickly when things go well. The problem mm -hmm. with this one is when you've got the, just the two, three, six with those deep points, even if things go well, forgetting the gammons, if you come in to get to a recube for you is going to take, eight, I mean, it's difficult, right? If you, if, if, if yeah. he was on the, say he was on the three point and you, and you had the, the, the five and four or you even had the five point here and he was on the four point so you move your two point to the five point and put him on the four point now you're going to have a take because your turnarounds you've got a good board here say yeah. you, you come in you may say you skip out to the 18 you hit a shot it's not gin it's a lot of work to do yeah. to win the game yeah good point but I think I think you saw you solved it yourself as soon as you <laughs> like I had one lesson with Tim Cross myself and he, he broke, um, I'm not going to give his system away, but he basically said, 
There are three types of games, like say in the start position, you have 15% gammons against you. A holding game or race, you know, it's 5% or, or fewer. And a gammonish position, say 25 plus. Mm. The start position is 15. So when you get yeah. into, when you get into, if you just think high, this is high gammons, so just think this is 25 plus, either low, medium or high, this is high, high gammons, you need so many more games you need to be around the 40% yeah, take point. Uh, you know, you don't need to estimate exactly how many gammons, but if you just say this is high. High gammons. You've got to think, you've yeah. got to up your winning percentage by a lot, right? I mean, you've got it right. So you, yeah. I think, I think yeah, you know that's that. a good one. Yeah. Uh, which is, it's funny, I don't do that, but I'm going to start doing it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> believe it or not, I never thought of that before, but I think that, that, would, that, would, that would really like when you're getting cubed, just think: is it is it low, medium, or high gammons? And then and then you just adjust your take point. It's quite easy. Uh, quite a good way to do it, I think. Um, did you miss the double here? Yeah. Do you, yeah. Uh, what was the song? Yeah. So this is okay. So this is actually quite good because. Um, this is reflective of a problem where I, I double, I don't double one step before it becomes like, it's a, it's a double one step before I think it is, you know, I almost, I just wait slightly too late to, um, I wait until the position is guaranteed as opposed to capitalizing on the volatility that's presented here. And like, I can see this, right. Cause you've got, you know, you've got one on the bar, you've got two builders poised at getting another one at the bar. Um, there are numbers that cover that make or the hit and cover. Um, there are lots of numbers. In fact, if I if we did a kind of an O'Hagan thing here, we'd probably count up quite a few market losers, which I probably just didn't do at the time. You know what? Um, Before we look at like specific rules, just a similar principle to the last one. What percentage of gammas do you think you win here? If you can't win a gammon for money if you don't cube, right? It's Jacoby. Yeah. So yeah. What, what say you've cubed and he takes. What what percentage of gammons do you think you win? Is it just just say low, medium, or high? Medium. So the start position's fifteen. You think this position yeah. you don't win more than the start position? No, no, I'm saying you win more, but I'm saying medium because To me medium I guess it medium. Hasn't... Medium is the start position, 15. Like low is five, oh, okay, okay. medium is 15, oh, low is, high is 25 low is plus. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, well, then in that case, high. I wouldn't necessarily say like super high. I'd say maybe like 20, 25 at, okay. at top. Fine. But yeah. So call high. it 25. So if, if you win 25% gammons, how many, what percentage of games does he need to win? Uh, so yeah, he needs another what, 12 and a half percent in games to, to compensate for that. Yeah. Well, yeah. Assuming he wins no games himself. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'm trying to say okay, is so say the original is 25% and then he needs another 12 and a half. It's 37 because he's not winning mm -hmm. many gammons here. It's not quite that many because he wins some, but yeah. if he's, if he's take point is 37% effectively, do you think you're cubing early or late? Do you think you need to cube uh, earlier or later? Uh, I guess early. Much earlier, right? Yeah, yeah. Because he's got such a hard take. You can lose your market so easily. Yeah, that's a good point. I hadn't, so I, I don't, this is good because I don't really think, I, I think about estimating gammons all that much, or even if I, like not even necessarily doing the maths, but just thinking, thinking about the potential gammons one and its impact on the yeah. take point. Yeah. I guess I'm not thinking about it. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, in a sim, I mean, that's what, that's one technical way to look at it. But I think if you, if you went through that process on this position, you'd get there. But the, the, I think the easier way to think about it is uh, a bit similar to the last position where the turnarounds were quite hard for you. The turnarounds mm. are really hard for him here because he's got nothing. You see, he's only got four men on the six and he's got three on the eight and a blot on his 11, which is a liability. 
So if he comes in and anchors, he's got nothing. It's not like he can get anywhere close to a recue for a long, long time. Yeah. But see, I mean, basically, what I'm trying, if you, I can tell you haven't played enough against XG because the machine doubles these in a heartbeat so quick. It seems so early <clears> so often for money to mobilize the gammons, but even in a match. I think the point here is that you've got loads of upside and not much downside. Because if you give the cube away and it goes wrong, it's not coming back in your face for a long time. So it's the same as it's in the middle. So is this a pass for black already? Yeah, it is a small pass. It is a small pass. Right, okay. Um, it's pretty close, point mm -hmm. three pass. But just I, I think, think if I was if I was playing black I'd, I'd well, I don't know. I think I maybe would I maybe would have made an error in taking this as well. So my the way I think about these games quite sim simply when I'm being cubed is like basically all races and all holding games are takes, okay? I mean, unless you're down yeah. like 40 plus pips, you just take. When, uh, when there's a long way to go in a game, you just take. If you've got any kind of structure. But the problem, when you haven't got an anchor and you've got no structure, they're the ones you let go. They're the ones mm -hmm. you let go because you can get wiped out for a gammon and you, it's so hard to turn the game around. Like even if, what are you hoping for? The best you're hoping for is that his, he, he, I don't know, like he failed, failed blitz and you come in an anchor and then mm -hmm. you've got like a holding game, but you've got nothing on your side of the board yet. So like your best case scenario is not great, really. It's a bit hopeful to take the cube. So I think they're, yeah. they're yeah. The early, the early cubes, the only ones to let go, the early cubes are when, when you've got no structure, no development. It's so different if you made the five points here as black. A completely different ball game. But I think the, the, the huge point on this one is really, I hope you'll see this in, in a month or two months and just not, not be thinking, is it a double or not, but thinking, is it a take or not? Like the mm. just automatic when... If, when you've got an overwhelming race lead and he's got no anchor and you've got a board and he's got a block <clears throat> and threats and I mean you just got everything here yeah everything. yeah, yeah. You, you got mul multiple ways of winning the game and as that threats. happens you've already won it's a pass so yeah so, so if, if uh, he had the five point if he had his five point yeah is it still a, is it still a double I would maybe not even or it'd be close yeah probably not no you've got too much no it wouldn't be. I mean, if you take a check off his eight and five, it wouldn't be. Mm. Um, so I think that, that, I mean, that's a good one, actually. I think you're going to pick the checker players up very quickly from playing. I think the cube is going to take you a little bit longer. But I, I think, actually, rather than reference positions and memorizing and complicating it with reference positions, I think you've got you've got the power to know what to do if you just take your time and think about gammons and, mm. and win because you're very good at estimating game. You're you're very good at estimating the winning chances. You understand the game. Um, yeah. It's just using it. It's just using it. Um, yeah. Oh, and this, this is a, what's yeah. this one? Another pass. So this is very similar, but the other way around. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You haven't got anything as white. You haven't got a point. Yeah. You've got a blotting board. You haven't got an anchor. You're losing the race. What are you hoping for? This is a good. Yeah, this is a good. This is a good contrasting position because it's what this. It's going to be what losing close to thirty. What uh, twenty eight percent gammons. Yeah. Yeah, and you got nothing, no structure. So again, with by the same token, if I've made my five, possibly a take. Yeah. Might yeah. even be a double. I mean, like, yeah, probably would be a double because you haven't got an anchor. But yeah, for sure, you just need something. Yeah. When you're getting blitzed, and and you're losing a lot of get a higher percentage of gammons in the start position, you need to win a lot of games. So in order to win the game, you can't just be hopeful to like just come in and then build. You have to already have a structure. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. That's it. It's just just um, uh, having structure. Oh, this is. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. This so is quite interesting. Is this just? Is this? Oh, this is very similar to. Um, 
this concept in, in that position which you didn't cue, which was a pass, was that it's like only good things can happen and not many bad things can happen when you give away the cube. Mm. Think you've got to think about. I think we talked about this briefly in the, that cafe in London uh, with the doubling theory. You know, what, what what's the downside of doubling? If you're a favourite, why don't you just double? Yeah. Why don't you just double when you're a fifty point one percent? Because you give away the the exclusive ownership of the cube, the value of you know, having potential access to the cube. Yeah, and you give him the cube. But say, for example, like if he if he's in a position where he can never really turn it back when things go wrong, you're much more likely to give it hmm. because it's not coming back in your face. You don't care if it's in the middle or on his side. You so know? with this, yeah, with this, I think it's not so obviously. There's a whole there's at least 12 market losers that's clear before, right? before you even look at, before you even look at the hits let's just evaluate the state of the race imagine this was a race and you're mm. 80 versus 79 on roll say it was a flat race with uh no contact mm. and you're on roll as it even pip count or one pip behind how much of a favorite do you think you are uh on roll um, I don't know how it's going to be with an even race. Can't be much more than 50, right? 54? Way more than 50. You know? I, wouldn't you say? With an even with an even race? Yeah, I mean, you've, got, you've got the roll. So he's going to have to basically roll something special to, to compensate, isn't it? But the, so the roll gives you, let's say you roll an average. If you both eight. roll the same the rest of the, the game, he's lost. Oh uh, yeah, okay, fine. So just so being equal doesn't. Yeah, okay. So being equal doesn't necessarily mean it's a fifty-fifty proposition. Okay, so then, but you can't. But the chart over. I guess it depends on the length of the race slightly, doesn't it? Because the longer happens, the race, not, the more not chances that you much, have. Not that much. It doesn't change. I looked at it before. It doesn't actually change that much. But call it. Okay, I'm, I'm looking it up now. Uh, Eighty-eight. Like Sixty odd then. Um, let's have a look. Yeah, exactly 60-40, right? Okay, okay. That's quite that's that really useful sense, to know. Actually. So on a on an eighty pit race, uh, you're sixty forty. Um, let me just have a look for a hundred pips, just to. Mm. Um, trying to give you a system so that you can, kind of evaluate positions. From scratch. Yeah, I hadn't really, I hadn't really thought of uh, races in terms of how much the opening rolls equivalent. Were. How, well, how much the yeah, how or much how being much rolls much worth, the, yeah. uh, what are races in equi equivalent to game winning chances like percentages? I hadn't really thought about that. Sorry, so by the way, when when, uh, when it's eighty pit race, you're a sixty percent favorite. When it's a hundred pit race, mm -hmm. you're fifty eight. So it doesn't change that much. Okay. Okay, so, so that makes sense that it would go down um, slightly as the slightly as the race gets longer, right? Yeah, um, I'm just going to close that extra snowy, extra. I'm so old school. I call it snowy. Uh, <laughs> I played with snowy a lot more than XG because I took all those years off. But okay, so thinking um, uh, about the race, straight away you're a 60 40, 60, 40 favorite. If you if there was no contact, right? Mm -hmm. Then build in the hits. So it's two things, race plus hits. So how many hits have you got? 12. Yeah. And as it happens, sorry to be boring and make you work for your money, but if you hit, <laughs> if, if you hit how many gammons do you think you're going to win? If you put one on the bar and he's got two on the 16 against the closeout. Uh, okay. I actually, I have, I have a couple of formulas for this, but without using the formulas, let's just gut feel it. Um, one on the bar, a couple in the outfield, 10, 20, tw uh, 20, 25, uh, 20, okay, 23 20 something, right? Yeah. Between 20 and 30, probably on the 25, say 30, probably 30 mm -hmm. where he is. Um, I would say less, but yeah, but yeah, around yeah. there. 
I think if he's got, got two on the mid, it's something like 20. So if he's got two, those extra six pips, probably quite a lot. But I don't know, call it 23 or whatever. So you've got everything going for you here in terms of mm. your 60-40 favourite in the race, if it's a straight race. You've got 12 winners straight away and the gammons work in your favour. So that's the upside. What's the downside of cubing? Well... I, at the time, I didn't look at the downside of cubing. I suppose the downside is that okay, but you've got to get you've got to get into the habit. It's a bit like that six, very the, the opening six one where where you wasted that where you played the pip mm. instead of in you only think if you think of every play and every cube decision as risk reward. What's the upside? What's the downside? And you try and articulate it. Uh, I mean, backgammon is just the game of risk reward. That's it. So so I guess what, the down the, well the downside. I guess there's a couple of things. The downside is is that he takes, I don't hit, and he gets into a good race position, like he gains in the race and can recube, or that you know I'm gonna I miss. By, by the way, when the cube's in, so when the cube's in the middle, if that scenario happens, he's gonna cube you anyway, right? Oh, okay, yeah, that's good. That's interesting. Yeah, so it makes no difference for the no, in terms of the downside is yeah. you're playing for twice the stakes when things go his way. But cube access right. is, okay. cube access isn't an issue because this is a, a centered cube. It, uh, but it could be an issue when if I don't hit, then I end up leaving a shot and he can hit back. There are there are situations where I don't hit, I break my I break my board because I don't want to run off. Um, and then we're in this kind of yeah. But what I'm saying yeah. is, if you, you you decided not to double, so in that scenario, if you don't double, he's going to be he still to... has access to the cube. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the only downside really is, a you're playing for double the stakes when things go wrong, but your things are more likely to go right than wrong, because you've got all twos and double one, plus you're ahead in the race and you can roll any double as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So you got call it call double six, double five, double four, double three winners, basically, plus the eleven shot. You know, you got like fifteen winners. Say a third of the time you got winners, gin. Uh, yeah. So the downside is when you roll a number like six one or six two. You know, your sorry, six two hit six one, six three is hor is horrible. Hmm. And now, but even then, you may not have a cube, a recube. Um, and because it's six points open. So it's, it's again, it's thinking in parlays. Mm -hmm. It's thinking in parlays. Like what's the, we, we've discussed the upside. You want to be playing for double the state when you're a favorite. You want to be playing for double the state when you hit. You don't want to be playing for the state when, when you roll like a six, one or six, three. You don't want to be playing for the double yeah. the state, but you haven't given him any more Q access than he's got now. So the downside is very small, but the upside is very big. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and uh, you know, you haven't got that many bad numbers here because if you roll a five something, you, you can play off the six. You board. can play in board. Yeah. And the worst case is, I don't know, say you roll a six five or six four and you run and he hits. He's very far from gin because you might have a shake or two to come in. With the with the with the open six point, there's a lot of equity. Six, there. yeah. So I think this is a really good position for. If you really. Look, you can play backgammon fast, and eventually you will play things fast when they become second nature. But I think when you practice, apart from putting the checkers where you want them, when it comes down to a, a tactical or strategic de decision, you can literally just like list. The upside and the downsides of each play, yeah. the cube decision, you know, like the risk rewards, and I think you'll come to the if you do it that way. I don't have to do it; I just feel it when you yeah. play enough. You know what I mean? I just see it. I'm even race. I have a lot of gin numbers. I want to jack up the stakes. Uh, I don't see much downside if things go wrong. So, like, yeah. I just feel it. But when you're at your stage, especially with the cube. I think you maybe have to be a bit methodical and just imagine you're writing down a list of upsides and downsides. And like, I see Zizi's amazing at it. Like he, his whole book and mm. I played a shred with him and he just, 
but what's the upside? What's the downside? You know, just think so clearly like that. Um, yeah, I've read I've read that book as well. It's good. The story yeah. that there's a few things and there's a few things in there that I um, yeah, and just ch- fundamentally changed my thinking. I think you know the game. You like you 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 know you understand a lot of. The, uh, oh, this is interesting. <laughs> I, I I'm gonna, just going to give it one more shameless plug, but in this in this genius quiz <laughs> book, there's a, there's a position where I where I got the cube action wrong, and Sebastian Wilkinson said, um, whenever it's twelve pips or fewer, and you've got mirror positions, it's a take. Hmm. So yeah, so twelve pip, twelve pips or more, unless there's like ridiculous wastage on the ace, you know, like it's all on the ace, yeah. whatever. But basically, twelve pips or more mirror image is a take. Uh, apparently, I never knew that until a month ago or something. Hmm. I actually I posted this one on the on the backgammon strategy forum. Yeah, because uh, it was actually got some really good responses because I looked at this as a as a rolls versus rolls position. So yeah. basically I looked at a, I, I looked at a, a, as a three roll position, which I knew to be a pass three roll versus three. roll. if everything was on the, on the ace and the deuce? Um, and then I went, okay, so it's, it's a three roll position, but there's some, but it's no longer like a pure three roll position because there are going to be numbers that leave gaps and there are going to be numbers that waste. But, but they both waste in the same way because it's a mirrored position. So therefore, I, my logic was if it's a pass in a pure three roll versus three roll, and now we've got some wastage and, and bad numbers, but those bad numbers are reflected on both sides, then therefore it must still be a pass. Like it's an, it's, it's equal, good logic. It's just because but... you know too much. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe take it a step further and say, um, how much is a three roll position a pass by? It's close, isn't it? It's like close. it's going to be like just under eighty percent winning chances for the Something side. Like that. I'm not, I can't remember exactly, but it's not like a mega pass. Like yeah, if I'm, if that's I'm, a good point. If I'm playing a fish and I, I want to gamble, I might take it. Like I know it's wrong, <laughs> but like they they want to play you forever, and you're not giving away much. <laughs> I mean, okay, it's quite a lot, but it's not like insane, right? So. It's no good just saying it's a pass. Like it's very different if something's a pass by point zero zero one and it's a pass by it's a good point. point nine nine nine. Um, yeah, I definitely didn't. I didn't extend my thinking that far, but I, mean, I just uh, yeah. In these, I'm not the greatest on barrels. So I'm sure you can find someone better to tell you. I've got a, a few things I think about, I guess. And I mean, this would be actually interesting to put so the what checkers. Would you have thought- to fiddle around with the checkers to where where it becomes the borderline. So you know now, like three. Well, I've told you that rule with the twelve pips, but yeah, if you got, you know, say you take a checker off the six and another checker off the six, what would it be? Mm. And if you had four checkers left, five, four, three, so two. What, before you heard um, Sebastian Wilkinson's rule, yeah, what would you have done? Like, how do you evaluate this position? Yeah, like I said, to be honest, I'm not good at them. Um, I'm not great at them. Um, I, first of all, I, I, I kind of think like, yeah, a bit, a bit like you, it's three rolls, but I feel like I own the cube and if he rolls badly, I have huge recube vig uh, mm. when he rolls badly. And I often think like, say he rolls a 2-1 or a 3-2 straight away, who's favourite? And if, if he rolls like a really bad number and your immediate favorite holding the cube, it can never be a bad take. It's like one of the things I think. And it's not mm-hmm. that scientific. Um, but I must say, I'm, I don't seem to make many errors in these kind of bear off things. Um, but I don't have any, I don't do EPC. I don't, I can't, I can't really explain it. Um, there'll be better people. Uh, yeah. To explain this to you. The, um, I, mean, the, and, I think there's, a, there's got BG some good responses on the forum. Where I did, well, on that bgquiz.com where I did that opening response quiz, um, David Potter posted today that, that now there's like 60 bear off problems like this as well. And I just thought like, <laughs> that's my worst nightmare to sit down and have to do 60 <laughs> of these because they're just like, yeah. a lot of the time it's just maths and a few references. Yeah. Like if you, 
you you got the three point reference, the three roll position reference, but if you build the reference just by playing around with them with a hundred different positions, mm. well, I would just go straight for the borderline. So say like you got five checkers left, play around with it until you find where it's borderline take pass. You know what I mean by borderline take pass? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So if you if you find the borderline, then that covers everything. You know anything worse is a pass mm. and anything better is a take. So if you remember like 10 borderlines with, let's say one borderline with um, five checkers, one with four, one with three, one with six, one with seven, you know, you're there. You've got everything. Yeah. Pretty yeah. Much, you know? Yeah, that's um, cool. I'll do that. This is a, this is a good, yeah. good technical play, that one. Uh, we'll do two, three more cube actions, maybe. That's probably enough. Yeah. Um, Sounds good. There's quite a lot. There's quite a lot here. I mean, a lot actually. Is, I think I've explained the cubes a bit better to you than the um, the checker plays actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's have, let's have a... Let's just look. Oh at, yeah. Just okay. Look this is your, this is. Let me just look at your stats overall. Um, yeah. Because when I looked at them before, you didn't miss that many doubles. Um, if I look at detail, so let's have a look. Okay. So, oh yeah, you did. So 4% wrong doubles, 10% missed doubles, only 1.6% mm. passes. Wrong. How can it be so low? I make more wrong passes than that by a long way. That can't be right. Anyway, you're missing twice as many doubles as bad ones you give. So you, Mm. So you are missing a lot of doubles. That's your tendency. Yeah. So this this is interesting because I can s so I, I can see that making the bar or um, I guess hitting in the outfield. Uh, well, like making the bar is a market loser. Clearly. Um, but I actually wouldn't have found the pass here if I was on the other side. Yeah. I don't think. So you know what? I think because I would have gone... Your process about talking about market losers is a bit pointless when you've lost your market already. Right? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so, so, so um, instead of... Before you look at market losers, <laughs> right? That's a good point. I mean, it yeah. really is actually thinking about it. I don't mind to be a wise guy, but... You know, <laughs> if you don't understand what your equity is to start in in a position with the evaluation, um, how do you know what the market losers are? Um, so before you look at the market losers, you know, like let's do let's just do a quick estimate uh, using the well, you've got the numbers there, so you don't need right. to, I don't need to ask you, but when you're seventy thirty and you're winning twenty five percent gammons, you know you're at the borderline of your equity is uh, 0.84 by not doubling. Your borderline there anyway. You see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like if you don't double, your equity yeah. is 0.84. You're very close. You're very close to a pass anyway. So what I'm trying to that's say... All, that's what that's all trying, well and good. But that's, that's we're looking at the numbers now. And I, I don't know that I would be able to reason yeah. my way to that much equity. Okay, but even without the numbers. even without having to make estimates of, of, of percentage favorite and gammons, if yeah. you if you understand that this is close uh, to a pass, um, I, actually forgetting that, just in general, like the theory, I think is the stronger your position, the fewer market losers you need, because you you've got high equity anyway. So, whenever you're whenever you're um, Whenever you're solidly winning the game, you don't need that many market losers or volatility to cube. Because you, you, you're happy to double this. I mean, doubling isn't about market losers. I mean, it is technically, but the basic premise of a double so, uh, is, is um, you want to jack up the stakes when you're favorite, you know? It's like if I make a bet with you and I know, yeah. say you, you, you ran a running race today, you don't know how I run, right? But most likely, yeah. if we had to bet on a race, a 10K, you've got to figure you're going to be a favourite, no? Against me. 
Uh, I, well, I don't know that. Well, that's not you a, don't know. That's not a that, bet I would take. You don't know. That's the point. Like, you don't know where your equity is here. You don't know, but you know you're a favorite. Yeah. So the first premise is basically, when you're a favorite, you want to be if better, you're a right? You want to jack up yeah, the stakes. Okay. So yeah, that makes sense. Then, when it, you know, like, the higher, the more favorite you are, the bigger favorite you are, the less market losers you need because you, you're virtually there anyway. If, if, you've, um, if it's a really volatile position, you're not that big a favorite, you need loads of good rolls that can happen to queue. But when you're, like, say you're in a holding game uh, with a, a 30 pip lead and your only clearing numbers are double five, double four, double three, you've hardly got any market losers, but you're winning the game by yeah. so much, you just want to give the cube anyway so it's like yeah you know like you're, you're clear favorite here right so you want you want to be playing for double the stakes and i know he's got the bar but he doesn't have anything you know like you're gonna hit him with all sixes fours maybe ones uh so like he, he's almost certain to be on the bar here and he's got that block on the 11 and he doesn't have a point in board to to, to balance you're not primed. Yeah. He's just got nothing. In fact, all the all the cubes you've missed, or the like, this was a pass, or the one you would have taken, or you did take, mm. they've all been positions where you know you got nothing. You're quite high equity. Well, not just that, but the opponent doesn't have much. Like, okay, Black's got the deuce point anchor, and he's got the bar point. But other than that. He's got a strip mid, he's got a blot on the 11, he's got a stack on the 6, he's got a blot on the 18, he's just, just he's got nothing here. You're, you're five pips up on, um, in the, uh, in the race on roll, he's just going to get gangbang too often here, you know? Mm -hmm. And by giving the cube, when you cube because you're favourite, it's, what I'm trying to say, is similar to the other one, is that this isn't a position where he's going to get to the recube quickly. When he can't get to a recube quickly, don't be scared of giving the cube when you're a small favorite. I mean, here you're a big favorite, but even if you're a small favorite, because, because it's the same like it's in the middle. If, if things go wrong and you're still a small favorite uh, and he can't cube you out, it's like the cube's in the middle. It's only positions where you're really scared to give away the cube because if it goes wrong, you're going to get it back in your face and lose all that equity that he's robbed you of when you have to pass or face a horrible cube. But here, what's going to happen? Like, visualize. Let's just say, let's forget that, say you didn't understand anything about market losers mm -hmm. in doubling theory. And I just said to you, you want a cube whenever you're a favorite. And the, you queue more aggressively when he can't get to a recube quickly, and and less aggressively when when you're going to get it back in your face soon. What what would he need to do to get to a recube here? Because that's the only time you you care so, about him giving the cube away. Yeah. So name the parley. Uh, well, so immediate. Well, to be, I'd, I'd miss him, hit me back, I danced quite a lot, basically, to get to an immediate recue. Keep going, keep going. Tell me the whole poly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, I miss, like, yeah, I miss him, he hits me back, uh, he builds more inner board points, he escapes his back checkers, then builds a prime in front of me, and he, yeah, a, a hell of a lot, basically. Massively, massively wrong poly, right? Yeah. Long parlay. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. But what's the parlay for things for you to go well here? Uh, any hit in a fan, making the bar, um, hit and bad entry. Millions of hit. them, right? Loads of parlay. There's loads, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So just That's a good way of thinking about it. Yeah. Without thinking about market losers, just when, when loads of things can go wrong for you, right for you and not many things can go wrong, just ship it. It's like it's a gambling game. You're playing for money. You want to win money. So like, it's the same in a match score. You want to win points. If you're a favourite, that's a bigger. Like I would forget market losers for now. For you, honestly. 
the I'd more for, the I'd forget more we... thinking about market losers. I'd forget thinking about counting shots. I'd think about playing enough to put your checkers in the right place and cubing when you're a solid favourite, passing when you haven't got anything, thinking about gammons a bit when, when you face cube decisions. Just basic. Mm. Yeah. I think the more the more we talk about this one and the different ways we talk about this one, the more it's, it's become sort of glaringly obvious. Like, yeah. It well, isn't, yeah. Even if you take market lose. I, I suppose, like, thinking about the parlays each way is sort of like thinking about market losers in a different language, right? But But forgetting that for the moment, this is... Like I've got the rack, he's and a ton of threats. Boom! Send the cube. Hmm. I mean, even if um, it sounds crazy because it's not a race this position, but say you you were one hundred and fifty six, hundred and sixty one on roll in a straight race, you're already going to be like close to sixty forty favorite. Hmm. You know, so like you've got. Yeah. The race advantage makes you 60-40. You've got the stronger board, you've got the shots, you've got the prime. The air. But the most important thing is the cube's never coming back at you. Even if things go wrong, you roll your worst. I don't know, like 5-2. Uh, is that your worst? 3-2 uh, maybe or something. No, 5-2 is your worst, I mm -hmm. think. Say you make, you play 11-8 and eight with a 5-2 or 6-21. Mm -hmm. and, and then what? I mean, like, Black's got to roll double five, you fan, like, so much got to go wrong to get that cube back. You may as well just put the cube over there when you're favorite, you know? Yeah. I had, I never think about the opponent's immediate ability to re-cube as a factor as well. Like, I, I suppose when I think of, when I do think of market losers, then I, I end up thinking about their what happens when it doesn't go right, which is kind of close to that thinking, but how quickly they would have a recue and therefore how much, I guess, recue big am I giving them is not something that typically enters my thinking. So that's new to me as well. Well, I think it's, I think, I think you don't, you know too much and you don't fully understand doubling theory yet. Like the, the cube action, which I'm so, I don't mean to be patronizing, but it's like, um, hmm. if you break it down to basics, Say, for example, he was never allowed to recube. Um, what percentage would you need to be to cube? Um, well, okay, so. Well, last roll position. Money... Say a last roll position. Oh, fine. Uh, 75. On a last roll position? Not to take, to, to cube. Oh, to sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, just over 50. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's maybe that's the way to think about it, that if it's a last short position, you're not getting the... It doesn't matter about the cube coming back at you. You just need to be a favourite. Yeah, okay. So if you think about it like um, the more likely the cube back to come... The more likely the cube is to come back at you, the more of a favourite you need to be. But when the cube's not likely to come back, you don't need to be much of a favourite to cube. Mm -hmm. And here, yeah. you're, you're a big favourite. As, as you see, it's kind of like pointless counting market losers when you lost your market already. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyway, you know what? I think that's good. Um, it's a lot to take in, I think. Um, mm. So all I would say is, like, when you play, don't count shots as much. Just put, try and play purer, a bit purer. You know, keep the checkers, like, where you want them. Maybe next time we'll play some net gammon. Just like uh, yeah, well, I think it's kind of fun. I'll give um, I'll play twenty just as an experiment. I'll play twenty money games out without thinking at all about counting shots, just to see yeah. as an experiment, see what happens. Yeah, I mean, it might be a small something. You, you you just get a feel for just putting the checkers where you want them, like trying to play pure, and then take your time when you've got a close decision or um, a cube action. Instead of counting shots, just try and evaluate. Like, who's a favorite in this position? You know, like, yeah. how many gammons am I? As soon as you said in that position, you don't have to give the exact percentage, but if you say low, stop, you know, like 5, 15, or 25. 
Mm. As soon as you're in the 25 to 30 range, you can spot it instantly. You did it. Yeah. You know that that take point's so much higher. It just changed the way you think about it completely. You know, there's a, the back gamma's changed, the gamma's changed everything in these, in all these positions. Yeah. Um, you know, like I'm sure holding games and races, you, you know, the take points pretty, pretty yeah. well. So it's only gammons that complicate it in, in other positions. Um, but I think that's enough to get on with. Maybe in a few weeks we'll play some nat gammon. That'd be kind yeah, of Yeah, sounds great. Just to play pure. Okay, yeah, man. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, James. Good luck with it. Great. Take it easy. Ciao. Take it easy. Bye-bye.